Uh, well, uh, all Corfacians, good morning or afternoon, depending on your perspective and where you're from. Um, thanks for joining us, and we're very excited about having uh, KC join us. Um, for those of you who do not know, KC is the CCIM chief economist, and Kerman Conway is the actual uh, name. Uh, he's the director of research and corporate engagement at the Alabama Center for Real Estate. Um, roll Tide. Uh, so uh, Conway, he's, I've heard him speak before at CC, many of the CCIM in Atlanta. Uh, he's, he's also speaks for the Federal Reserve, state bank commissioners, some academic groups, professional organizations, and a lot of industry associations. So we're very, very pleased to have him. Uh, he uh, previously served as chief economist for the Colliers, uh, which is, we'll, we'll, we'll give him a pass on that. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, he's, uh, he lectures quite often in a lot of international conferences. He's consulted with major governmental agencies and also, as we mentioned, uh, I think he, uh, on a first name basis with Ben Bernanke, is that correct? <laughs> call some, him Benjamin. Some, some days, some days. <laughs> <laughs> and then other days, it's Mr. Bernanke. <laughs> and, uh, so we really uh, thank you, KC, for joining us. I will stop talking and let you uh, tell us uh, how we're going to make money next year or this year. <laughs> thank you. There, there you go. Just, just don't do any oils future, oil futures trading is my recommendation today. <laughs> I think we're going to learn lessons. So real, real pleasure to be with all of you guys today and representing uh, CCIM, uh, which is a you know big, big, big um, supporter and fan of, of Corfac, and then the Alabama Center for Real Estate. So gl glad you got that one roll tied in there. I, I grew up in Colorado. I went to business school at Emory University. And I, I'm probably the only employee at, at, on faculty at Alabama that misspelled Coach Saban's name and is still still retained on staff. So <laughs> that'll be my legacy. So uh, my, my information's there. If there's anything afterwards, you got both my uh, Culver, House, uh, University, Culver House within the University of Alabama and my personal email there. Let's go ahead and go advance to slide two. There's my disclaimer. So you guys are protected. Um, these are all my crazy ideas and thoughts. So um, don't, don't blame anybody at, at Corfac uh, for, for crazy ideas. So there's my disclaimer. We'll go on to slide three. So the way I thought we'd um, start off, um, and I've been doing this the last you know week or so, you know, all of us are trying to do forecasting and, and whatnot. And I, I wasn't a big fan of, of history when I was a kid and student in school because the Catholic nuns just made us memorize dates and that was no fun. But later in life, I actually realized there was context around all those dates. So I've become a bigger fan of history. And I thought, you know, really one of the best quotes we could look back on to help us as we try to do our forecasting, especially since we're in, in earning season right now and, uh, and giving guidance is start off with a good Winston Churchill quote. So he actually gave this in 1940 at a eulogy. And I, I love it. It says, it is, it is not given to human beings happily for them, for otherwise life would be intolerable to foresee or to predict to any large extent the unfolding course of events. So we don't know what's gonna happen or whatnot. We just have to, the three pieces of advice I've been giving is look up and forward. Yeah, it's, it's your only chance to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I will put the, the caveat in there that not all lights at the end of a tunnel are the exit in fresh air. Some are just another freight train coming down the tracks. And uh, the other one is to engage in daily what if thinking. If you just think back of the headlines and news stories from a week ago or two weeks ago and what we're looking at today, it is really mind boggling. My, my 40 year career from helping my family and in their real estate business in Colorado, I was in business school through the last 35 years. I, I, I couldn't fathom anything like this and I survived the Fed 2005 to 10. So well, there's my quote to put it all in perspective. We'll go on to slide four. So this is a piece I wrote uh, about 10 days ago that I thought would be very relevant because as we start to look at data and we chart it, and even as we go forward and lift out of the economy, um, what we're gonna find is that all of our economic rulers and benchmarks, they're all obsolete. You know, when you go from 2.3 million uh, airline passengers a day to less than 100,000, where you go from, you know, oil to zero. Um, jobless claims, I think the number today, uh, I checked before I got on here, was 22 and a half million jobless claims. 
you know, we'd, we'd never even seen, you know, a million type jobless claims before. So all these metrics aren't gonna make sense in the charting. Um, I put a few of them here at the top. So there's the TSA passenger throughput that we'll talk about. I think this could be one of the most predictive forward looking indicators as we lift these shelter in place orders. Um, because if we don't see airline passage, passenger traffic resume really quickly to over a million or a million and a half, um, we're in real trouble in a lot of areas of the economy. The psychology's uh, been permanently damaged. Um, jobless claims number now, look at that from, you know, a week ago when I did this, you know, 10 days ago, nine under 10 million to over 20 million and then oil demand. So the, the numbers today is we have, I think it's 150 million barrels of oil stored on floating uh, container, um, container vessels in the ocean. And that is equivalent to all of the oil demand for five days for Russia, uh, Asia, Europe, and us, that's how mind boggling it is. So a couple that will maybe maybe cheer you up a little bit. Um, Prologis, I would encourage you to look at the Prologis earnings from yesterday or the day before. Incredible insights by their CEO, but one they had teased us with before their earnings was that two and a half percent of the world's GDP moves through their warehouses. That's a mind boggling statistic. And the numbers for Prologis were really encouraging. 88% um, of the tenants paid rent, they had over 180 leases um, in the in the last uh, 30 uh, day period of time. Uh, the capacity as well, um, things are functioning pretty well. And even though they predict that um, total industrial uh, demand is gonna drop from say 200 to 300 million square feet a year to maybe 100, that's only gonna move the needle on vacancy to maybe five and a half percent. The other one I've got there in the middle is Port Laredo. So even before COVID's uh, full impact uh, in the January and February da data, Port Laredo surpassed LA and Long Beach as the busiest container port in the country. And I highlight that because everything we think about in industrial and logistics is gonna be remade just like all the other property types. So just like after the 2009 financial crisis, many of you were participants or aware that we went to CMBS 2.0. We had to correct what was broken in CMBS 1-0. I was at the New York Fed having that fun with the, with the folks, our good friends at TREP. Um, but we're going to see that. Uh, if we see less manufacturing in China and we see more trade between Mexico and our partners to the south and the north, all of the logistics routes and logistics infrastructure is going to change. So the bottom half there, I put the ADP numbers that are now stale. You can see everybody that was losing jobs is what we thought. We had a little bit in manufacturing going up. We had a lot in healthcare and education and some in government. But on the right, the latest jobs numbers from the government that, we're, that are now looking at almost two weeks sale, there are a couple of key points um, that I wanna put in there. Look at the disconnect in the unemployment rate. How can we have over 20 million jobless claims and only a 4.4, less than four and a half, five percent unemployment rate? And the answer goes back to that chart in my opening comment on this slide, economic rulers and benchmarks are gonna change. The CARES bill for the first time ever allowed um, a 1099 employee or 1099 workers and um, sole proprietors to file for unemployment. And so that spiked the numbers way high and the BLS doesn't know how to account for that yet. And because the way that typically the way the BLS counts you is unemployed is if you've been laid off or furloughed until your benefits from your company are burned off, then you're not counted as unemployed. So we have a lot of employees that are still being paid through April, they're getting medical benefits. And until all that burns off, we're not gonna really see the rise in the unemployment rate that's gonna connect with the jobless claims, which is capturing everybody today. The other one is the last bullet point. The actual average hourly earnings went up uh, in March and everybody gotta be scratching their heads. If we're all losing our jobs, how can wages be going up? And the answer is, the math is changing on all of these metrics, the numerator and denominator. So if you if you have you know 20 million plus fewer people that were at the low end of the wage scale and hospitality and retail lose their jobs, the remaining entities that are reporting earnings are higher skilled, higher wage. So it looks like wages went up, but we're not comparing apples to apples. So it's really important when this data comes out. I go first to the footnotes to see what changed in the context. Um, but all these metrics are going to change. So that's my warning uh, there. And this is why Winston Churchill was so correct. Next slide. 
So what are some forward-looking metrics that I rely on that have always proven well to me? So one of the best is the National Federation of Independent Business Small Business Optimism Index. This is 60, 65% of our economy. It's a comprehensive survey each month. They look at what's going well and what's broken in small business. And you can see in their latest index, it was the largest monthly decline in the um, NFIB's history since they've been tracking data. And you can see on the right side, all the red arrows pointing down, but there's one green arrow. It's not the kind of thing you wanna see. It's not the arrow in the category you wanna see green unless it's preceding the holiday season when retailers and warehouses are stocking up for the holiday season. It's a rise in inventory. So this re reinforces the thing that things aren't moving, things aren't selling. Uh, you can't give apparel away. Um, so I would really watch this. And at the bottom is the index in the, in the history uh, going back at least five, five or more years here. And you can see that the plummet uh, down below 100 was the first time since Trump's been president that the Small Business Optimism Index went below 100. Uh, it had been in the 90s or worse, you know, for about eight years. Um, so it's, it's a good indicator that tell you the pulse. If we don't see small business reopen and get optimistic and, and have capital to reform, that along with the airline industry and the TSA passenger count, these are going to be really um, predictive bellwethers going forward. Next slide. So uh, this is a piece I wrote um, about a week, 10 days ago, that um, actually has been my most downloaded and viewed um, weekly insight. These are all free. You can see the link there. You can go on our on our Acre website and you, you have to opt in under constant contact under the, um, under the uh, communication and email rules, um, but it's free. Uh, but I wrote this one, and, and you know I'm a little bit crazy in the Red Shoe Economist, but I, I'm always looking for things that we can relate to. So I loved preschool and kindergarten as a kid. I loved picture books. I hated going beyond uh, kindergarten because then they got rid of all the picture books. And I, and I love that we learned things like them bones and how our bones connect. So I use this to really emphasize, this piece emphasizes how as we go through the virus and we stand the com economy back up, we have got to be paying attention to which bones are dislocated and which ones we need to re reconnect in and what sequence. If we get them all wrong or, or, or not in the right sequence, we could end up with our head bone connected to something near our hip bone and, uh, and then the uh, skeleton doesn't stand, stand up very well. So this is a piece I'd, I, I'd refer you to. We can go to the next slide. So, as we go through this, one of the things that I think is important, this is the spine of our economy. It's the spine of everything we do. And it's our fiscal health. And it's not just at the federal level, but it's at the state level, our corporate level. And so this is um, one that I want, really want to draw people's attention to. So before COVID, we went into this year, this calendar year, this fiscal year for the government with uh, $23 trillion in debt. We were on track to have a first fiscal year uh, that had a trillion dollar deficit since 2009. So we didn't need an extra trillion dollars of stimulus spending here in 2020 before COVID, and, uh, but we were on that track. So if you look at what's happened since, we have uh, basically added $5 trillion to our debt. We did the CARES bill, we did CARE 1 at 2.3 trillion, we did another 300 and something billion yesterday. Uh, the Fed has ballooned its balance sheet by another 2.45 trillion. And I want you to remember, the Fed doesn't make or sell anything. So when you, when you, ask, you need to ask yourselves, how does the Fed grow its balance sheet? And the very simple, honest answer that uh, the people in the Fed hate for me to, to, to convey is they call Treasury, they call Mnuchin, and they say start the printing presses. And this is inflation, we grow the money supply, we're a fiat currency. That means there's nothing backing the value of our currency. We're just like everybody in the world, all 184 nations. There's nothing backing our currency. And so we're a fiat currency. So I want you to pay attention to look at what's happened to the Fed's balance sheet. So, um, you know, a year ago, we got the balance sheet back down below $4, four trillion. And we've already ballooned it up over $6.4 trillion. And I fear this could go eight, nine, ten trillion dollars $10 before we're done. And that's just the Treasury printing money for the Fed. And look at the things that the Fed's been spending its money on. So uh, securities, you know, we're, we're in with the corporate paper market, we're buying that stuff. Look at our US Treasury securities. Why do you, we, even with the intervention, we still can't get the, the 10 year uh, Treasury back to 1% or anywhere near two or th 3% again. 
and then look at notes. These are all the municipal bonds and things that we're having to intervene to support airports and cities. And one of the big stories we're going to see unfold this week is the number of states whose unemployment trust funds are being rapidly depleted. And in 2009, we saw 35 of our 50 states have their unemployment trust funds depleted and have to have to borrow to pay it back. And so most of the last decade, these states have been paying back what they owed instead of rebuilding. So I want you to really pay attention because as Congress goes forward, we need to focus on our needs and less on our wants. If we spend on the wants and the politics, we're gonna go bankrupt. So if you go to the next slide, this is translating that to a state level. So um, you, can, you can look at um, you know, your different state here. So at the top is a slide, the map that I was presenting at the beginning of the year before COVID, looking at what states were in good fiscal health as a proxy for which ones could attract economic development and um, you know, provide incentives to, to attract industry. And so you can see the, the orange uh, color not so good and, and the dark blue and light blue are pretty good. So you can see Nebraska and South Dakota and Tennessee and Florida and Oklahoma were really in good shape. If you go to the bottom though, this is a recent piece by the Pew uh, Charitable Trust. They just published it in the first week of March and they looked at all of the states and what their daily reserves were. How much did they have in rainy day funds and capital set aside? How long could they operate their state without any federal support? And the average around the country is 48 days. Um, but some states are much better and some are much worse off. So Wyoming is the best. Uh, so Wyoming has um, you know, over a year in total reserves. So Wyoming, they could just turn everything off, forget all of this stuff and come back in a year and be just fine. Oregon, Texas, think of this, Texas without a state income tax has over a hundred days of operating reserves. Absolutely phenomenal. Now look on the other side of the equation, Pennsylvania, they only have four hours of operating reserves. That's, that's just mind boggling. Uh, Illinois, where you guys, uh, some of you guys are, are based up out of, it's, only, it's less than five days. Kentucky, less than 10 days. So what, the reason I want this to be on your radar is as we move through this virus and we have to fill the holes and figure out what bones have to be reconnected, one of the unpopular political bones that's gonna enter in here is there's gonna have to be more fiscal support at the federal level for states that entered this in fiscally bad shape. And that's not gonna play very well in your, strong, your fiscally strong states in, in the South uh, and in parts of the West. So I fear you know, this is gonna further divide uh, us politically over you know, essentially fiscally sound states having to basically go on their own or go without federal support to support those that were in pretty dire situations. So this is, this is something to pay attention to. I was looking at this before COVID really as who was in best position to do infrastructure projects and attract economic development. And now it's just who's in the best shape to survive and where our federal dollars are gonna go. So we'll go to the next slide. Sorry for those noisy birds. Um, so on this particular slide, I, I wanna show um, where we are in um, the types of, types of recessions that we're looking at. So we're all hoping this is a V-shaped recession. I'm not in that camp at all. Uh, V-shape is a very sharp decline with a very sharp recovery. That's what we had in 1991. It's also what we had in 2001. I'm in the camp that we're gonna probably at least have a W-shaped recession. That's your, your next best shape you hope for, it's a double dip. And um, this is what we had in 81 and 82 uh, in the early 80s. And so I think as we lift these shelter in place orders and then we start to stand the economy back up, by fall, we're gonna realize all the holes that didn't get plugged. And we're gonna slip back into recession. When we realize that one in four small businesses were, are already gone today and it could go much higher than that. That 40% of all restaurants are closed. Uh, the latest National Restaurant Feder uh, Association report, go to, their, go to their site, I'm writing a piece today on it. It'll be my, my new win uh, tonight, my weekly insight. 80% of all restaurants have laid off almost all of their workforce. The numbers are staggering in the Restaurant Association. So the one we hope we don't get is a U-shaped recession. This is where you wanna do a U-turn and get away from this. This is what we had in the 70s. This is where you go down and you stay on the bottom for a long time. And when you think, you know, what we went through in the 70s with inflation, oil shock, um, you know, the beginning of the SNL crisis, all of that type of stuff, how bad that was. Look at the industry shock that we've had, whether it's 
energy, whether it's transportation, whether it's tourism, whether it's hospitality. I really fear, you know, if we don't have a W, we'll, we'll probably be a, U, a U-shaped recession. So we need to keep our, our elected and economic leaders focused and honest about our needs. The one we hope we don't get is an L. This is Japan. You go down and you never come back. Um, the one I, I fear, though, the most is a Q-shaped recession. This is a made-up one by the Red Shoe Economist. A Q-shape is the circle part of the Q is our big piggy bank, it's treasury. And what happens is the Fed sticks a little slide into the Q and they drain all of the money and we become a fiat currency that has nothing of value. And, um, and basically we can get inflation from two, two areas. We need to keep this in mind. One area is from commodity prices, whether they go up or go down. So we're seeing tremendous deflation in commodity prices. But we can also get inflation with declining commodity prices when our currency is viewed as having no value. We've seen this in Brazil and Latin America. If we go to the next slide, and maybe we'll, we'll take a pause after this next one, this is what happens. So this is my recommended um, post uh, uh, webinar Zoom meeting here reading. This is a piece by a, a friend of mine that published this over 12 years ago named John Lifflander. It's titled, How International Monetary Trends Affect Real Estate Values. And what it really is, it's a history um, of fiat currencies that collapse. And the last one to collapse um, was Germany after World War I. And you can see in the chart there, in April 1919, uh, so we're looking 100 years ago, uh, the, the, the German uh, paper mark to the US dollar was 12 to one. And a mere four years later, it was 4.2 trillion to one. This is what happens is all of our central banks start printing money and we try to you know, go to zero or negative interest rates, at some point, the people that hold assets realize your currency is worthless. And we, we restart everything. And so um, this is sobering. I keep sending it weekly to the different Fed presidents to make sure they understand that we are a fiat currency, there's nothing backing us, and that if they do too much intervention, um, this, this could result. So with that, maybe, let's see, uh, let's go one, let's see one more. Maybe we'll take a break here. That's this next slide. So yeah, let's, so this one, this was uh, you guys, your Chicago Fed, very smart. We usually wait a year for the National Business, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research to tell us we're in recession. The Chicago uh, Fed, they've got a great national activity index I would follow. Um, and they said, look, it, we're, not, we're not waiting a year. We're not waiting on the NBA, NBER. Um, we're done, we're in a recession. So it's already been called. Uh, you know, tag your it. Your Chicago Fed did it first above everybody else. They're they're sharp on this. Uh, I would follow their National Activity Index. It's going to be a good forward forward looking one. We'll do one more slide, then we'll take a pause, take some questions. So, after all that, we wonder, well, what about our debt in commercial real estate? How are we looking on commercial real estate? So this is a this is a graphic and a chart that I spent about 18 months doing in 2009 and, and 10 for um, when I was at the New York Fed after Geithner left. And all my briefings and the pre-FOMC process for Chairman Bernanke and the Fed presidents was, how bad is it gonna get in real estate? How much money do we have to put in the banks? Do we have to put TARP2 in? Do we have to go and create a thing called TALF? And the answer was yes. The banks were over 50% 50, 50 concentrated in commercial real estate among all the property types. It was a liquidity lockup. Here's the good news. For commercial real estate, we're not all locked up by property type with one lender with one exception. See that orange bar, government agency? The Freddie, Fannie, and government-sponsored enterprises hold 93% of all multifamily loans in this country. So if you wonder why the Fed was so quick to intervene on behalf of the GSEs, remember the GSEs failed in 2009. I was at the Fed. Um, they only had 1% capital. I had warned them back in 2006 that we should be forcing the GSEs to hold more capital, that things were, were building and a storm was coming, but they didn't. So we put them in conservatorship. The government's made a boatload of money off the GSEs the last five years. Um, so they've intervened and done the loan, loan forbearance program. But I wanna, want you to look at the lighter shade orange and the lighter shade blue, which are for um, multifamily and, and hotel. I guess my index fell off there. Um, but anyway, the the middle orange, if you look at the top across CMBS, 19%, financial, 27%. Uh, and then on the retail, the light blue starting with 16%, then going down to financial 14. What you can see 
is that on these different uh, lending sources, none of them are going to be completely crushed by hotel or retail. They all have enough powder and enough reserves and recapitalization to work things through with borrowers, whether it's forbearance or restructuring the debt. And this is something very, very different from 2009 and why we're di different. Um, so the Fed's intervening on the GSEs part, the government owns them, everybody else, we have enough powder that hotel or retail will not crush any one lender type. Um, so that's a good piece of news. So if we go to slide 13, then we'll take a break here. We'll take some questions. So this is the piece I want you to print out and I want you to put on your bathroom mirror or near your bathroom mirror every morning as you're shaving. This is what I, I put together. We did a lot that um, the folks at Real Capital Analytics, uh, Jim Costello and uh, the Real Page folks are, are keeping alive today. They're saying, how bad can it get in commercial real estate? So two things drive the value up or down cap rates and your NOI. And so what we had in 2009 is we had a very rapid early spike in cap rates. We went from 6% to 8% cap rates in less than three to four quarters in 2008 and nine. And so look at what happened if you go from, you know, say a six to an eight, or in this case of five and a half to almost a seven and a half, that's a quarter of your value is gone. All your equity is gone if we have that. I don't think we're gonna have that this time around. We didn't have 0% interest rates. We didn't have the Fed intervention. We didn't have the liquidity measures. So all those things caused a liquidity dry up. So only the guy that had equity and cash could, be, could set and dictate the cap rate. We don't have that this time. So I don't think we see huge value erosion from a big spike in cap rates, but I worry on the left side, NOI erosion. This is where we're gonna get clobbered this time. I think even in industrial, we see 10 to 15% decline in NOI. Um, Prologis already gave us some guidance to that, that rents are softening, um, vacancies rising, and we're going to have higher expenses in terms of sanitizing the warehouses and having, you know, virus-free boxes going through our, our warehouses. I think we're also going to change the model for logistics, and we're going to see more smaller buildings than big million square footers. We might go to 250 to 500,000 square footers. So where do we end up? That bottom right corner, minus 40%. That's where we ended up after the financial crisis in 2009. We lost 40% of the value in commercial real estate. And it took years to rebuild that and restore that. So um, I would have this in front of you. I would translate this by property type, by region of the country, and by market. And it's going to be very, very different. That minus 40% might be an understatement for retail, restaurants, and hotels. And on the industrial side and maybe the multifamily, um, it's only in the 10 to 20%. But this will be the most powerful tool to keep in front of you and do what if thinking every day. What if this changes? What if that changes? And the one variable I put in here that could change the cap rate thing is what's happening in mortgage servicing. So our mortgage servicers, even though borrowers get the ability to enter into forbearance and put the deferred principal and interest to the back of the loan, the mortgage servicer still has to advance those, those funds to the uh, investors and the bondholders um, of those assets. And so that's caused major entities like Invesco in Atlanta to teeter on the verge of bankruptcy. And they've draw all their lines of credits from the bank. And this is where the CRE finance piece could get locked up. I, I did read where they gave some relief they, um, at the, the Fed level and, um, and whatnot. They've said that mortgage servicers only need to advance four months of forbearance um, rather than the full six or 12 months. But many folks can, can forbear up to a year. And that would just destroy our mortgage servicing industry, CMBS, securitization, uh, and all that. So why don't we pause there? Uh, the news gets a lot better from here. So I've given you all the bad news up front. So I'm going to take any questions, anything in the queue? Let's see. Uh, yeah, so one question was, was this what this chart is showing that 93% multifamily is the GSEs or that all the GSE lending exactly? It's mind boggling. We knew it was a big number, but I, it even shocked me when I saw the new data as to um, how much how much it happened. Let me go back to the top. Um, all right, any others? I, it's like that was the one uh, question there. We'll see if they get let less shy. All right, we'll go on to slide 14, and then we'll take questions at the end. I'll hang around as long as you'll let me. 
All right, so let's look at the property types here. We only got about five slides to go. So multifamily, um, I thought this was a great piece that was just put out by the National Apartment Association to remind us all where a dollar of rent goes. How does it get divided up between the lender, between expenses, and what does the property owner get? And what we're gonna see is some squeeze on the multifamily uh, owner, because as we move forbearance to the back um, of, the, of the mortgage to be repaid, we create a much, much higher LTV. So you take front end payments and you move them back 10, 15, 20 years, your LTV goes up quite a bit on the deals, which could create stress in terms of repaying some of the debt uh, as we go forward. The second thing is I think our operating costs are gonna go up. Um, I have a daughter that said she's not going back to an apartment in grad school unless the, uh, unless the landlord replaces all the drapes and the carpets. She thinks the virus can live in the carpets. So we're gonna find a much higher tenant turnover cost. We're gonna have some of the psyche stay with us and we're gonna have to do much more sanitization and, 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 and um, activity during a, a, a turnover side. The other thing is on the right side there, look at distinguishing workforce multifamily from student housing multifamily. I think workforce will hold up much better than student housing. Workforce is our cities where our workers are. Um, and I think they'll, through forbearance programs, through the GSE intervention, they'll be doing fine. I'm very, very worried about student housing. I think we could lose 20 to 30% of our colleges and universities in this crisis. They're having to rebate fees and uh, all kinds of items uh, with the students uh, having to return home and do distant learning. Um, and if you look at what's happening into the um, free market, non-university controlled student housing, both my daughters, uh, both undergrad and grad were in such situations in Florida and in Alabama. And their leases had um, active God and active university clauses in them. And so they lost their jobs, they had to come home, they were stressed about their, their lease went till August, what were they going to do? So I sat down with them, we read the lease, we found these Act of God or Active University clauses, and we were able to terminate their leases at the end of March. So now that investor that has all of the thousands of students in, in different markets that are doing the same thing, um, I think the stress in student housing is going to be, be much, much greater. Uh, I'm really worried about our college and university towns. They didn't get anything in the, in the CARES Act. They have a lot of holes to plug. And the states that don't have um, reserves to help their, their universities, an underpinning of what was making our economy strong was creating that workforce, that skilled workforce. So if we lose transportation routes in secondary cities with air service, if we lose universities that are creating that STEM workforce, these are the things that'll distinguish what cities and states come back economically strong. The other one I think we need to think about that we don't know the answer to is what's going to happen in terms of urban versus suburban multifamily. So the trend was before COVID is everybody to go back to the city and be urban and not have a car and do Uber and, um, you know, scooters and we had, we had terms like scooter litter at our office buildings. I think that could reverse for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think that psyche like my daughter's. Um, they don't want to go back into a dense situation. This is a scarring much like what happened after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, the population moved inland, away from the coast. So I think we could have some change between the demand and where people want to live from urban to suburban. And uh, I think we need to pay attention to that. The other thing is families and millennials are going to be financially beaten up by this. And they may not be able to afford those class A rents in the, in the urban areas and may have to return to the suburbs and deal with uh, some level of commuting in order to make the economics work and not have to move home with mom and dad. So that's my take on multifamily. Next slide. Retail, this is going to be really interesting. So on the left side there, the CCIM Institute in uh, University of Alabama, we published a paper last fall in October uh, called Retail Evolution. We wanted to get rid of the term apocalypse. And really, if you think about it, retail is always evolving. It's from the first cavemen people, when they came out of the cave and realized there were other cave dwellers, uh, they, they wanted to evolve and trade things and create the barter system and, and you know, currency and everything else. I would encourage you to read that paper, or look at that. It's not a hard read. Everything we forecast in there to happen by 2025, it's just been accelerated by three to five years. The trend towards online grocery, it just got accelerated by three years. The trend toward buying cars online, it got accelerated. 
everything e-commerce has been accelerated. So just take whatever dates I put that were 2025 and move those to 2022 and 23, and the paper's all updated for you. The link is there. This chart in the middle here uh, is from Visual Capitalists. They're a great source, if you, don't, if you aren't familiar with them, to look at. And Visual Capitalists, um, they're looking at what we're buying and what we're not buying. And so you can see we're buying a lot of disposable gloves, but you know we know some of that will go away. But look at some of the things that may not go away that may be predictive to retail. Bread machines, go further down and look at weights and fitness equipment. So in my own household, we took one of the kids' bedrooms that went away to college. We didn't think they would come back or we wanted to make sure they couldn't. So we've ordered um, you know, different gym equipment and my wife now does Zoom Zumba in the home <laughs> exercise room. And I don't think she's gonna go back to the gym. So retail that had a lot of these gyms, uh, I was reading about LA Fitness, they're teetering on the brink right now. Do we see in retail, the fitness and gym survive this whole cycle? Look at what's not selling, look at the bottom. Luggage, uh, briefcases, swimwear, none of us can go to the beach, none of us can go anywhere, uh, apparel. So we need to rethink, do what if thinking, what if what we used to do in retail changes dramatically? What if we have become so comfortable with online e-commerce and retail that you know things that we never would have bought before, like a swimsuit, we now do? Uh, and what about you know what's happening with fitness and gym equipment might be predictive of what's in our tenants? So this is one uh, to do what if thinking. I don't think it's that we're going to stay buying disposable gloves is the most important thing. Um, but I think we may see that PP and E is something that we give at Christmas this next year. So we'll go on to the next slide. So let's stop right here on retail. I did multifamily retail and then we'll wrap on logistics. See if there's any thoughts or questions about multifamily or retail. I know most of you do a lot of office in, um, a lot of office and industrial. Any multifamily questions? Make courageous. It's a quiet group today. We'll go on and we'll open it up. So slide 16 here, logistics and industrial. This one's gonna be very fascinating. Um, my, my weekly insight that I'm writing today that'll publish um, this afternoon, this evening probably, uh, is looking at this. And I would tell you, look at earnings, read the Prologis earnings from yesterday. If you read one and you're an industrial, this is the one to read. And the numbers are actually pretty encouraging. The other one is Equifax. So Equifax is telling us some really interesting things that are gonna to happen to the consumer in their credit score, how they've had just a, an incredible increase in credit inquiries for everybody that's trying to look at um, forbearance issues. They're not agreeing to it unless they run a new credit inquiry. So anyway, let's look at logistics. So on the left side is my logistics transformer. I wrote this paper at the University of Alabama a year ago, January, February, we published it. We created our own transformer. Um, my, my son wanted to know I did something relevant. So if I got invited to to school to tell what I do for a living, I could say I, I make transformers. <laughs> but we put all the elements of logistics in this graphic, to explain trucking and shipping and rail and air cargo. And um, the essence of the paper really was explaining how logistics and retail were converging. And we were evolving from a shop and take home economy to an order online and deliver to me. And everything in that paper from over a year ago is exactly on spot. And if you're not in a investing in real estate or in, engaged in real estate in markets and regions and states and MSAs that have upgraded logistics infrastructure, you can connect the port bone to the rail bone to the trucking bone to the warehouse bone, you're not going to see the economic development. And this has all been accelerated uh, again. We're also going to see things change from where we manufacture and how it comes in and where that logistics infrastructure. So I'll give you a good one being in Alabama. During the virus here at the uh, Port of Mobile, which only handled less than a half million containers a year, um, had Walmart open up its new distribution center. We just upgraded the port, the terminal uh, container terminal port, uh, part of the port over the over the virus here last month. And Port of Mobile will rival within probably 18 to 24 months the number of containers that are handled at the Port of Charleston and could support could surpass. Uh, the Port of Savannah within three years uh, with what's, what's going to come through. And um, so to look at how that's happening, to the right is an article that was just done by Forbes where it looked at, um, where it looked at um, 
Port Laredo and the different ports and how Port Laredo and the numbers even in January and February brought in ahead of LA Long Beach. And I think we're gonna see the importance and the volume of containers coming into our ports change radically. It's gonna be much more uh, Gulf Coast and East Coast concentric than West Coast. And so I'm anxious about all those folks that loaded up on a lot of West Coast warehouses at three and four cap rates. Um, I, I think it could be a, a problem, but it's to do the what if thinking. So if we go to the next slide. So these are some of the forward looking transportation measures and resources I would look at if you're an industrial to help you. So my favorite is the American Association of Railroads. They have a real time indicators report they publish every month. There's the link to it, costs a big 125 bucks a year. Uh, the latest data, like everybody else's, no surprise, it was the worst ever. They started collecting data in 1988 and this was the worst total traffic, intermodal container traffic, everything terrible, but read on. Go down to the lower there, the lower red box and the term I've got there, demand shock. This is what concerns me where your what if thinking needs to come in for industrial and logistics imports is uh, demand shock. So this is where when we wake the, the economy back up and we get rid of shelter in place orders and we find out that a quarter to a half of our businesses that were ordering inventory are canceling them and renegotiating when they're gonna get delivered. They gotta be backed up in warehouses like oil. Where do we store it? How do we resell it? How do we remarket? So get used to this new term called demand shock. Uh, it's, it's been around, we haven't used it very much recently, but I think it's gonna be one that's quite predictive. If we go to the next slide, we're almost done. Then we can take questions. So these are some of the others, the American Trucking Association. We should see that truck tonnage index spiking straight up and we're not. Part of it is because nothing's coming in from the ports yet, nothing's on the rail, just nothing to be moved by truck to the distribution warehouses. And honestly, we're treating our truckers absolutely terribly. 80% of all of our, of our trucking companies own less than 10 trucks and they're devastated. They're devastated financially. Um, the truckers can't stop at rest areas on the interstates. They don't have drive-through for 18 wheelers at truck stops. They can't go into the truck stops, use restrooms, order food, um, none of that. And then when they get to the distribution centers, they can't get out of their trucks. They can't go in and get a cup of coffee or use the restroom. So we have a mess that's happening on our, on our trucking side. On the right side is the CAS freight index. And this I want you to pay attention to because what happened to us in 2009, I think could happen again here. You'll see the big spike in 2009 where inventories, the business, um, to sales ratio uh, spiked quite high because we had inventory rise and nobody buy anything. Um, right now it doesn't look so bad, but I think as we reawaken the economy and we have everything restockpiled as we need it, we're gonna find the consumer isn't spending. And the last one I mentioned earlier was the TSA passenger uh, count. This one may be our most predictive indicator going forward. We've gone from 2.3 million passengers a day down to less than 100,000. It was 85,000 last Friday. I think it was 90,000 this morning. You know, that's, that's a 95% plus destruction of air travel in this country. And think of all the Uber drivers, the hotels, the restaurants, everything tied to that that is destroyed. Parking at our airports, our municipal bonds. So we really need to see this stand up. Um, the Fed is, is stepping in right now and helping buy the municipal bond airport, uh, bonds at our airports. So this is a, a really critical piece. And I think we'll get to the last slide here, slide 19. So uh, I'll give you my five best thoughts. Um, and I only have five, I'm, I'm 58. You know, you, you, know, you know, you're in your 50s, you only get five items you can remember. So I'll start with the first one I mentioned. I think we see a W-shaped recession if we're lucky, and I hope we don't end up with a U. But I think we have a double dip recession later this fall after we open the economy back up. Just like CMBS, we saw CMBS 2.0 after the 2009 financial crisis, we're gonna see logistics 2.0. And if you wanna know what logistics in, in warehouses are gonna look like going forward, go walk down your cereal aisle at your grocery store. We're not gonna have homogeneous packaging with all big one million square foot warehouses. We're gonna see a lot different packaging and sizing, and we're gonna to have to solve last mile, and we're gonna to have to solve, if something goes wrong in a warehouse, how do we not have it cripple the supply chain. So in Arkansas right now, the largest meatpacking plant in North America had an outbreak of the virus with some workers. So for the next two weeks, they're not processing any meatpacking. So I hope you stocked up on bacon over the weekend. Um, bacon makes everything better, even during the COVID virus. But we're going to see shortages of beef and meat products here 
because of things like that. So do we have these mega massive processing, manufacturing, distribution facilities? I don't think we do. And I think as a part of risk management, we have not had public health and supply chain uh, risk as part of our risk management box. We thought about cyber terrorism, we thought of financial crisis, we thought of economic cycle disruption. So our, our management is gonna become, I think, more octagonal than square in terms of what we think about. Number three, think retail evolution. It was happening before this. It's all been accelerated. Um, and so it's it's gonna it's gonna get it's gonna get um, continue to evolve. Everything in our retail evolution paper just changed the dates from 2025 to 2022 and 23, and it's all updated. Adaptive reuse. I don't know how many of you deal with or occupy space in adaptive reuse properties, but this is going to become our most important skill set in commercial real estate. If we we're going to have so much commercial real estate, whether it's hotels or empty retail or restaurants or free standing out parcels, that we have to repurpose. And if we don't, they don't pay a lot in taxes, and that hurts our, our local and municipal and state governments. So we're going to have to figure out what do we put in these places. I think some solutions are gonna be things like telemedicine. We may see t uh, telemedicine take over branch banks. Um, so we need to be thinking about adaptive use. I wrote a paper on this with the CCIM Institute a year and a half ago. You can go to our ccim.com forward slash insights and all the CCIM papers that we do in content are there. So even if you just get to ccim.com and you forget the forward slash insights, um, but that's where you'll find that. The last point I would give, there's two last points. What we are going through is going to be tougher and take longer than what we're imagining. This isn't something that we're gonna solve where we open everything up by Memorial Day weekend. This is gonna be a gradual relifting. We're gonna see the virus spread in hot spots around the country, probably all the way to the holidays and around the world. And we don't have a vaccine yet. We don't know if once you've had it, if you're immune and can't be reinfected. There's a lot we don't know. And the psyche has been hit. The consumer's balance sheet has been damaged as well as our government and our businesses. And they're gonna to have to rebuild those balance sheets and are gonna be less of a consuming economy. Look at uh, a Delta Airlines um, in terms of its earnings and some of the news they're giving in terms of these major companies that are canceling all their CapEx programs. I'm in Alabama, we've had every automobile plant close. We've had Toyota that's building its new plant in Huntsville say they're gonna defer it by a half a year to a year. We've had Airbus shut down its plant in Mobile, its new plant. Airbus isn't a US company. The Europeans and French don't have the dollars to bail it out like we're trying to do Boeing. We could see whole plants and new operations that just don't come back to life. And we've got to connect those through. So here's what I think the two big takeaways on commercial real estate that we're going to end up having. The first is on the right side. I think the only way we open this economy fully up is we're going to end up with immunity passports. So those of you that have TSA clear, TSA pre-check or the clear system, we're gonna see our public health added to the clear or TSA pre-check. You're gonna have something on your phone that has downloaded all your immunization records, whether you've got the current flu shot, and they'll end up taking your temperature for the first three months before you can get on a plane at the airport. Get used to it, it's another loss of our, of our privacy and civil liberties, but we got used to it with TSA pre-check and clear, and we're gonna to have to add public health to that system in order to get our transportation and travel moving. And it's not just gonna be at airports, it's gonna be at major venues. It could even be at college football games where you've gotta have your immunity passport that's updated every 90 days. And the last one is in our properties, we're gonna to have to do a lot more in terms of occupancy monitoring. So companies are gonna have in their leases requirements to report any kind of um, illness or outbreak or someone's got TB or what percentage of your workforce travel to a, a region of the country that has a public health crisis. Um, we're gonna to have to do a lot more sanitization in our building. So the property management elements are gonna become much more complex. Um, Denise Fromming and the IRIM folks are doing a tremendous job on all of this type stuff. Um, so if you need any help on property management, really reach out there. They're, they're doing a great job on that. So I guess I'll leave you with look up and forward. It's the only way we're going to find any kind of light at the tunnel. And even if it's a train coming down the tracks, at least we'll know to jump off and have a chance to survive to find the real light at the end of the tunnel. Engage in daily what if thinking, like that matrix I just showed you. What if this happens? What does that do to my values? And the last thing I would say that I will compliment um, our corporate Amer our corporate community this time around. In 2009, I don't think the large banks, I don't think the corporate community behaved very well during that. 
um, whatever stimulus and intervention they got, they kind of kept it to themselves. It was top down and it didn't, it, it, it was uh, top down, top up, top up, <laughs> top oriented and didn't trickle down. The intervention this time is bottom up. It's with unemployment, it's with workers, it's with small business, it's the Fed intervening. They move quickly to get the interest rates to zero. They're providing the intervention to provide the liquidity. This is very different than 2009. It's not a liquidity crisis. This is a workforce and industry disruption like we've never seen. Um, and I think you almost you have to go back if you had the full polio outbreak right at the same time as the Great Depression, everything else, you'd come close to comparing this. So I'll stop there and see if you all want to talk about anything else. But the corporate America has been behaving very, very well. I call it greatest generation type behavior. So everything that you do any day, think about your grandparents, think about your parents that were part of the greatest generation. What would they do? How would they behave? I think that we're creating a new generation, a new greatest generation in our millennials. I'm very optimistic they're gonna power through this. They're behaving very well. Um, I, I wish maybe some of our large banks and our DC politicians could behave greatest generation like, but hey, at least we got the PPP program uh, refunded this week. I thought it might take weeks to get it done. So I'll stop there, see if anybody wants to talk about anything. Hey Casey, it's Jonathan. Uh, thank you very much for doing this. It's been fascinating. There are a few questions that are on the chat uh, line here. One okay. is from Paul in Kansas City, where he says, how do we pay all this back over the next 20 years? <laughs> it's a really good question, Paul. That's why I put the fiat currency thing up there. If you go back in the history of how we get rid of massive amounts of debt, we create massive amounts of inflation and we devalue it. Uh, go back to Paul Volcker. We need to keep Paul Volcker alive to at least under, understand how to not go through the late 70s to 81 again. But one answer is if we don't collapse as a fiat currency, we, we allow inflation to develop and run hot to devalue that debt. Um, I think it's also important why we look at translating our federal debt to the state level. So I was kind of joking a little bit at the end of last year and the beginning of this year about our fiscal divide that if we didn't get our fiscal house in order, that we might end up with our own form of Brexit um, here in the United States. And I came up with a term on it. Uh, it's called Flexit. Florida and Texas just exit. They've, they, they've got all the retirees, they've got all the wealth, they've vacuumed all the workforce. And I joke a little bit about that, but we're at such a divided uh, level of, of um, divided divide in our country and, and the animosity is so extreme. I don't know how we how we can really make all of this work and we may end up with our own form of Brexit, I hope not. But generally the answers historically have been, you create a lot of inflation, you devalue the debt. If that doesn't work, you collapse as a fiat currency and we restart all over again. Option three, flex it. <laughs> Does the answer, Paul? <laughs> I'll tell you one last piece. We're in the CRE, we're in the real estate industry. One of the things that happens in these periods where you have a lot of debt and you potentially don't know what your currency is worth, People want to hold tangible assets. Real estate is a good thing to own as a protection against this kind of stuff. Go back to the 70s. Anybody that entered the 70s owning a home uh, and made it out to the 80s, that home about tripled in value during that time frame. So real estate is a really good hedge in this. So for your clients and your customers and, and whatnot, where you're looking at where to put that money, if you can't buy back shares, look at maybe owning some of your own real estate. So real estate's a good protection. That help? Yes, thank you. That's great. That was still very depressing now. <laughs> um, Casey, if you got time, we, we got a few more. Sure. Uh, from Rob. Rob asks, why are you seeing the shift to centralized East Coast ports and away from the West Coast ports as previous? So I started studying for years, gosh, almost a decade ago, um, and helped be develop their port reporting and the Panama Canal expansion was just underway and people thought it was crazy. Nobody would, would alter ships from the West Coast to the East Coast. And what they didn't understand were a couple of other things that were happening. Number one, that two thirds of our, of our um, population lived on the East and, and Gulf Coast rather than on the West Coast. So there was more demand there. And did it make sense to supply everything from, from China and Asia from the West Coast inland? And the answer to that was it's pretty expensive. And where it got real expensive was all those containers that came in from Asia through LA and Long Beach. Uh, they ended up in places like Chicago 
and they were empty and you had to send all those containers back. And so the problem came with the industry called matchback. How do you fill empty containers up and send them back so it, it's not so costly? And if you remember about two weeks ago, Mayor Shipping sent the world's largest container ship to LA Long Beach to pick up all the empty containers to clear the deck so new goods could come in. So one was this concept of matchback. What do we do with all the empty containers? How do we reduce the cost from just sending empty containers back to Asia? The second thing that we were seeing was the Panama Canal was gonna have an impact. Um, although we can't, you know, put, you know, 15 or 20,000 container vessels through there, it was a big improvement from say 3,500 to nine or nine to 10 or 12,000. You really can't put 12,000 because they didn't do the math to figure the tugboat. So you can only do about nine, nine to 10,000 container vessels. The other thing that we found is our logistics infrastructure. Go to the uh, American Association of Railroads and look at the map for our railroads. And the class one railroads and all but two of them move through the center part of the United States and connect the Gulf and the East Coast. And those two exceptions are BNSF and UP, Union Pacific. So if we're getting things off trucking, which was a trend I predicted 10 years ago, we're gonna get off trucking and we're gonna go rail, it's more efficient, more technological. The rail infrastructure is favoring the Gulf Coast and the East Coast. And in fact, in Mobile, little old Alabama, we have more class one railroads that connect to the Port of Mobile, five than any other port in North America. Charleston, Savannah have two with CSX and Norfolk Southern. Um, and in the Port of Mobile, we even have the Canadian railroads that connect from all the way up in Vancouver and Port, um, free, um, Port Rupert, all the way down and end in Mobile. So the other thing that was happening was our trade and our manufacturing was shifting from Asia to Mexico and our neighbors to the south. So more auto components, the average wage rate in Mexico is cheaper than that in Asia. So we needed our infrastructure to work better going north, south, and east, west. So look at what Kansas City did with the Kansas City Intermodal and Kansas City Southern Railroad. Look at their latest earnings. Look at these railroad number earnings. Kansas City was really strong and encouraging. That traffic from really Mexico and south with the new trade deals, the new tariff deals, all of those components, materials, raw goods are gonna be much more conducive to a north, south than an east, west. And then the last thing is people forget that Europe, so Canada and Mexico combined are a bigger trading partner than Europe. And next, believe it or not, is was Europe before Asia. So all of this uh, traffic and, and our ability to export, think of all the manufacturing that we do in the rail, whether it's um, BMW in South Carolina or Boeing or um, Mercedes and Honda and Toyota in Tennessee and Alabama, or even go up into the Midwest, all the things we manufacture, they don't go to the West Coast to be exported. They go to our East Coast ports and out that way. So it's a confluence of things that, that really um, had, that you know, preceded this, I think what we're gonna see is a diminution in manufacturing and trade with Asia. Um, it was all of these things combining together where it was solving the matchback program, trucking moving to rail, where our rail infrastructure was located, um, and our density of our population centers. So it's a confluence of all those things that were coming together. In that logistics infrastructure paper, I go through, it's about a 50 page paper, but we tackle all of them in all of the modes of transportation. A couple you, others, Casey. Casey, if you don't mind. Um, how do you see the vacant retail space being repurposed in the future? Strip, mall, strip centers, malls, et cetera. So really neat and challenging question. So I think a couple things are gonna happen. Think what was happening to our retail centers going into COVID. We were backfilling it with experiential retail and more services and more restaurants. I think that diminishes or unwinds and we go back to more consumer staples and selling goods things uh, than we do all this experiential retail. I think that has a bigger impact in the urban areas than it does um, in, the, um, uh, in the suburbs. I think another one is we began to see medical go into retail. I think telemedicine has been launched in the stratosphere. Your end cleaner that made end um, kind of box cleaners at the end, um, many of them are not gonna make it through this. Um, and you might find that in repurposing those that you can put two or three adjoining boxes together in the retail center and do telemedicine where I can drop off a test, I can pick up a test, um, I think that telemedicine is going to be a big part of that. We already saw that trend towards medical and retail, um, but I think we're going to have a lot of it left over. I think on the restaurants, one of the things we have to look at retail is these things that were experiential and that were restaurant oriented, 
that they're only going to have the same volume maybe as before, but they're going to need more more real estate. So they're either going to need to have more distancing and spacing out of the tables. And so the restaurateur or that experiential retailer is going to say, look, it, my business model is still only $2 million a year in revenue, um, but I, I need twice the space or that revenue model is going to drop from $2 million to $1 because I can only have half the spaces and half the dining, and I can't pay any more rent. So we're going to reprice retail. We're going to reprice rents, and it's going to mean we're going to reprice that in the value of the real estate. So I think uh, retail is going to be consuming of more space but not able to pay more rent. I think telemedicine and medical will continue to advance. And um, we may find that last mile is solved in a lot of retail. So this was already happening. We saw Amazon go in and buy a Toys R Us stores to do last mile. Um, we've seen Kroger go and partner with drugstore chains to basically do their fulfillment. Um, so I think we could see some partnering in logistics and retail where we use some of that a vacant suburban or anchored retail and it really becomes part of the supply. I got one more. Yeah. Okay, I'll try, I'll try to have one more answer. <laughs> we'll, we'll finish off with an office question. Okay. Uh, with possible office space demand down due to working from home, could we also see open space slash bullpen space go back to hard wall offices? I think absolutely. So I'll give you an encouraging outlook. I, I actually think that when this is fully lifted six months from now and next year, we're going to see record leasing activity in office space. Because I can tell you for one, I sure value the, the, you know, have a new appreciation for the value of an office as a place to go to where the kids aren't going, the dog's not jumping up, the beagle's not barking. Um, I think we're going to value that. But here's our trade-off. We don't want to go back to long commutes. We're not going to go back to leasing office space in the city and long commutes. I think suburban office is going to be the beneficiary here. We value being at home. We value being close to home and being able to engage in more activities. And that means if I can trade off the commute and still get the benefit of private office space and a place to go work and maybe work three or four days a week without going into the city, I think that's going to be something that employees are going to communicate to their employers. And so I see suburban office as a beneficiary from us working at home. And I do think we're going to have to rethink the open space model. I don't think we're going to have the same density of cubicles. I mean, we went from 300, one per 300 square feet, what, 10 years ago, to where we were below one to 150 a square foot here um, going into this virus. I think we're going back to one per 200. We're going to get rid of about a third of the cubicles. And I think from the janitorial and the property management, we're going to see a lot of change. There's going to have to be more sanitization, more monitoring uh, that the uh, tenants are going to have to uh, endure and report. And I think we're going to see a lot of things like hardware change in our office space. We're going to go to touchless hardware um, and we're not going to have door handles and we may, uh, you know, have the different way that the elevator keypad is programmed. It may be voice recognition rather than touch point. But I think a lot's going to change and it won't be tomorrow, but it's, I think these are trends that are going to happen over time. So I think it's going to be more capital intensive. I think suburban office benefits more than urban. And I'm actually optimistic we all are going to want to go back to the office. We're going to back, we have a new appreciation for the office. Is that hopeful? <laughs> Unless anybody else has any questions, uh, why don't we wrap this up? It's almost 10 after 12 central time. Casey, thank you again very much. Uh, for all of members of Corfac that were on the call, we had about 60 of you. Thanks for being here. Uh, this has been recorded. Uh, we will share the recording and the slides with you uh, soon. So unless anybody's got anything else, KC, thanks again. Yep, anything we can do or the CCIM Institute, let us know. We'll do another one and or when we get back to work, maybe we'll get together and have a drink or something and help the economy. Um, you know, keep in mind, look up and forward, do what if thinking. Uh, we will get through this and we are creating a new greatest generation. And I tip my hat really to the to corporate America, the behavior, you read all the stories, you know, about whether it's the grocers and opening first for seniors and, uh, you know, the extra capital they burn through uh, to keep employees paid and medical benefits. I tip my hat to corporate America. We, we should not be shy about letting everybody know and our politicians know that corporate America stepped up this time. Excellent. Take care all, stay safe. Take care. Thank you.